the Cadillac Cimarron is widely considered to be one of the worst cars of all time not because of what it is, but because of what it represents. It was the peak of General Motors' lazy, cynical rebadging to take an inexpensive Chevrolet Cavalier, make minimum modifications to it and try to pass it off as Cadillac's new sport luxury compact car. Donnie had bought it from a 91-year-old lady who purchased it new with her husband to tow behind an RV as they drove around the country. Her husband, travel partner passed away, so it was time for the car to move on to a new owner. As such, this Cimarron came equipped with the ultra-rare factory tow package that was available straight from Cadillac in perfect, complete working condition with additional lighting on the rear, tow bar hookups installed in the front and the tow bar itself to tug it along. She and her husband lovingly maintained the little car, which had just over 60,000 miles when Donnie got it, and it came with a fat stack of documentation for everything that had been done over the years. The seller even drove it to meet my friend to hand it off. The team was Donnie, W. Christian, Mental, Ward and me, which worked out fairly well most of the time given that two tall dudes and all five feet four inches of me made it sort of easy to Tetris ourselves into the small car in a way where no one back seat occupant had a front seat all the way up in their crotch for very long. That was a risk, it was cramped inside, and filling it up with three people's stuff for a week a massive pile of which had to be carefully arranged into the empty half of the back seat definitely compressed the suspension a bit. If there's any one thing about the car that sort of fit in with boat era Cadillacs, though, it was the floaty suspension. After we took a lot of the stuff out, you could noticeably see the car transfer its weight to the rear when it set off. It was soft and springy. It lacked the refinement of the self-leveling air suspension in Mom's 89 Deville, but wasn't too harsh, either. The interior wasn't fooling any of us, though. The dashboard was a slab of titanium-colored plastic that looked like it belonged in a blazer. The seats were faux leather vinyl with cloth inserts. There weren't even cup holders. If it hadn't been loaded down with three people and enough of our stuff to adhere to the Girl Scouts' motto of, be prepared, that 85 horsepower probably would have even been adequate for this 2,630-pound car. I dare say its RV touring previous owners probably weren't using it to buy furniture or items in bulk, so it'd do the job. Maybe you'll write this off as vehicular Stockholm syndrome from me spending a week making a big, over minus 2,100 mile lap of most of Texas with two other goofballs, but the Cimarron itself when considered separately from its context in history wasn't too bad of a car. It really surprised me that this infamous flop was really just an average little GM sedan as opposed to some great car Satan where the small bit of cadillacifying somehow made it worse. Of course, being an average GM sedan was its cardinal sin. Meanwhile, the Cimarron is relatively reliable in the way that most older GM cars are, the drivetrain holds up and the heater will roast you in no time it's just that everything else around that might stop working or come loose.